All right, welcome to chapter seven, where you're going to be learning about some of the techniques that we use for measuring uh, the brain and behavior relationship. So there are a number of models that we use to link behavior outcomes to the brain. And we have animal models and human models. Animal models include a lesion or ablation of brain areas. Basically, you would, you know, you could damage a region of the brain and see what happens in an animal. Knockout mice, this refers to actually removing um, a particular gene and seeing how removal of that gene affects behavior. This is not done willy-nilly. This would be in association with behavioral or behavioral genetic research that indicates that the genes involved in serotonin or greater reproduction of serotonin or dysregulation of serotonin or, or any of the neurotransmitters, for example, um, might be involved in depression or a particular behavior. And then if you were to test this hypothesis by uh, modifying a gene or removing a gene and seeing how it uh, affects behavior in animals. This is not something that you can do in humans. So we have knockout mice and we have behavioral testing. So this would be an example of behavioral test right here. And this is just one type. There's all sorts of behavioral tasks that animals can do. Um, you can teach them to do things for rewards. They can have learning tasks. So there's a wide array. Uh, another type of method is deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation is when you would put an electrode into the brain and you would use that electrode to, to release a small electrical current that would then impact the activity of a group of cells and you would see how that affects behavior. So this uh, is done in humans. I'll actually talk about it a little bit here and then um, you'll see the method shortly humans as a preparation for uh, brain surgery. So oftentimes before you have brain surgery, if you're going to have a tumor resection or if you're going to have epilepsy surgery, they need to confirm which side of the brain is uh, your language center. And for most individuals, it's on the left-hand side. So most individuals are right-handed, so their language center is on the left. And you can confirm this by doing a deep brain stimulation and seeing how, if you stimulate that region, if it actually impacts uh, language fluency. fluency. So if someone is doing some preoperative testing and they might, in particular for epilepsy, before they remove part of your brain, they'll often do really extensive uh, testing and which they will actually open up your brain and they'll put something in that's called grids and strips and so this will be some electrodes placed in various types of the brain and then they'll wait for you to have a seizure and then those electrodes will, will record really important information with regards to where the seizure is. So it may seem really invasive to actually open your brain up before you do surgery, but if you're going to open up your brain to confirm what is going on in your head, you want to do that before you actually remove or cut out sections of the brain. So deep brain stimulation can be done at this time and the person can actually be awake and they'll put in these sort of subtle charges or release a little bit of electrical current and it's not to damage the brain, it's just to, to, to disrupt the normal uh, flow of electrical information in the neurons. So if you put like a little tiny trickle in there, then what will happen is someone like myself that would be speaking fluently, then as soon as you put the electrical information in, the person will stop. They won't be able to speak for a moment. And this confirms then that the language center is on a particular uh, side of the brain. Uh, and I'll talk about another deep brain stimulation method that is becoming more common when I actually get to the human models, which will be shortly. Then you also have histological review post-mortem. This is basically examining uh, the brain after the animal's death. So these human models, they often largely correspond to the animal models. So of course we have disease or damaged case studies, in which case we would be looking at how people with damage to their brain perform differently or how they have a particular disease such as Parkinson's disease. We have neuropsychological testing. And so these are very controlled tests that are designed to assess an individual's ability to engage in basic executive functions. This would be memory, ordering events, keeping on task, uh, verbal fluency, so the ability to speak fluently. 
And then again, as I mentioned, uh, the deep brain stimulation. So I talked about some animal methods and I gave a, an example of how deep brain stimulation is used in humans. Another way that deep brain stimulation has been used more in treatment has been to treat treatment resistant depression. And so there are uh, a select number of individuals who have very, very deep treatment resistant depression, that their, de their depression does not respond to psychotherapy or medication. And so these are treatment resistant depressive individuals. And it's been interesting to see some research on deep brain stimulation that there has been hypothesized that individuals with this type of depression, they have lower amounts of neural activity in a particular region of the prefrontal cortex. And so they've done some experiments with these individuals to see if stimulating this region to increase its activity actually can relieve the depression enough that the individuals respond to treatment. And so preliminary research suggests that this is so, that if you actually stimulate these individuals with a very small electrical current, so it doesn't actually damage their brain, but it tries to stimulate a particular region within the brain that puts them in a position where they are able to address their depression. So one of the ways that it's described is that these individuals will say that they are like deep down in a hole and they're so far down in the hole that they, you know, they see sort of the slide at the top, but they can't get out. They can't reach it. They can't do anything. Whereas after this deep brain stimulation, then it was akin to basically being able to grab hold of sort of the edge of that hole and so that they could then therefore use other treatments such as medication and psychotherapy to sort of lift themselves out of the hole more. And then you also have histological postmortem, which would again be looking at how the brain differs from other brains after death. So you can look at the brains of individuals with Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or following a stroke and see the physical damage that those diseases or conditions cause in comparison to normal brains. Here's an example of some histological postmortem. If you were to look then at a healthy brain and you were to take a section of the substantia Niagara, you would show these uh, cell bodies here. Uh, these are dopamine neurons and you would see them in this cross section and there would be, it would be thick, there would be many of them in someone with uh, a weakened substantia Niagara that would have Parkinson's disease, you would see substantially fewer of these neurons. And so you could see the physical differences in the brain. This is an example of a neuropsychological test. And this is uh, an order testing. So the examiner here would tap out a sequence of blocks, in which case they would, they would see these numbers here and they could say, okay, they would tap one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the participant who's sitting over here on this other side would just see them tapping. They wouldn't actually see any of the numbers. So they're only visible to the experimenter. And the subject over here would have to try to memorize the sequence in the order of tapping. And so this is an example of a neuropsychological test that would then assess an individual's ability to remember information and keep it in the correct order.